On to our final panel of the day. Now we're going to be talking about science, journalism, and activism. When we first put this idea together for the panel uh, last January, I guess it was, it was around the time that the Women's March was going to happen in Washington, D.C., and around the world, and not long after that, the Science March. And in my circles uh, of journalists, I heard a lot of conversations about whether or not it was appropriate for journalists to be participating in these marches and participating in other ways in activism or politics. Uh, for my scientist friends, I heard similar conversations going on there. Scientists, historically, of course, have been usually discouraged from doing advocacy. So where's the line in our areas of work when it comes to advocacy and activism isn't always clear. Um, so today, this panel is going to work through some of these issues, and to lead the conversation, we have our final moderator, Michael Lemonick, Chief Opinion Editor at Scientific American and a former writer at Climate Central and Time. Sorry, I'm getting so tired. I'm having trouble speaking. One other quick housekeeping thing. Um, we did have Andrew Friedman on the panel. He had to instead cover the hurricane as a, a reporter at Mashable. So. Stepping in for him, we have, thank you very much, Ivan Oransky, who is co-founder at Retraction Watch, distinguished writer in residence at NYU uh, in the Institute of Journalism, and the VP of the American Healthcare Journalists. Did I say that right? Research and Healthcare okay. Journalists. Okay. And I'll let you to it. Okay. Now, is this working? No. I mean, I can talk loudly, but um, all right. There we go. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, before I go too far, um, I want to say that I am annoyed at Robin here for running such a good panel in the last hour uh, that it's a hard act to live up to. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, one of the things that I appreciated about it most was that the audience was so, um, so involved and asked so many good questions. And so I I hope you will do that again, and, and in just the same way. I, I love the fact that you participated in the conversation and didn't wait for an um, end, um, end of the hour ghetto to you know, bark out your questions very quickly. Uh, I would love to have an exchange between you and the panelists, uh, whom I will introduce. So starting f here, I don't know what, is that my, that's my right. Um, uh, Stevie Bergman, who's I'm going to read this stuff because I know her, but this is a lot of interesting stuff that you need to know. Um, so she's a graduate researcher in physics at Princeton University, um, working on cosmology. It doesn't say that here, but it's my favorite thing um, to read about. Uh, on the side, she is head of, on the side, you should hear this stuff. She's head of research in the Princeton Citizen Scientists, and she's a creator and co-host of the weekly science-centered podcast and radio show, uh, These Vibes Are Too Cosmic on the Princeton radio station. And, and uh, what it doesn't say here is that there's also an enormous amount of music on this program. It's this crazy mix that somehow works. You should listen to it. Um, her past work includes uh, creation and co-direction of Girl Tech Uganda, a science and tech professional development program for girls, which she began while a Peace Corps volunteer. And she is extremely interested in the interaction between science and societal progress and development, which is absolutely why she's here. Uh, Ivan Aransky, you've already heard about. What's that? Sure. Excuse me? OK, yeah, well, good point. That's okay. It was a, it was a, a thoughtful question. Um, uh, Andrew Friedman is not here. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, founder of something called Ocean Collective. She's a marine biologist, policy expert, conservation strategist, and Brooklyn native. Founder of Ocean Collective, a consulting firm that creates and amplifies solutions for a healthy ocean while centering social justice. She teaches at NYU as an adjunct professor and volunteers co-director of partnerships for the March for Science. As executive director of the Waite Institute, Ayana co-founded the Blue Halo Initiative and led the Caribbean's first successful island-wide ocean zoning effort. And just uh, for a bit of uh, promotion of my own organization, she wrote a wonderful blog post for me about her decision to march for science. Um, and I, I got the headline here on my phone. Uh, but, but I never thought I'd be marching that's for it, science. That's it. That's <laughs> it. Um, and and it was it was really a distillation of, of the issue we're talking about here. 
Uh, and finally, on the end, Apoorva Medvelli, Editor-in-Chief at Spectrum. She is, as I know, and it says here also, an award-winning science journalist, the founding editor and editor-in-chief of Spectrum, the leading source of autism news. Her work has also appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker Online, the Atlantic Slate Nature, Scientific American, <laughs> and other outlets. Sorry, Maya. So, so <laughs> that's OK. It's all right. I'm, I'm here to, uh, to edit your, your very biography. Um, so, so I also want to say at the outset that this question of where, where the line is, what's appropriate for scientists uh, and for journalists uh, insofar as going outside of the sphere of their regular work uh, to be activists at some, at some level, whether it is simply in their personal lives, whether it is part of their work, how it informs their work, uh, how they separate those two things. Um, it, I don't, there, there's nobody who has an answer to this. And that's another reason I want the audience to, uh, to participate. Because everybody at this point is forming his or her own judgment about what the most appropriate thing to do is in this situation. Uh, you know, we've talked about living in um, unusual times with an administration that is more hostile to science um, and to social justice than, than any in quite a while. And um, sort of forcing us to confront these questions as we never have before. And people are making different sorts of decisions. Uh, I say that we have to decide for ourselves, uh, although if we work for organizations, uh, we're also constrained by, by what those organizations um, say we can do. So for example, in, in my own um, experience, when, uh, when the Women's March was, was first announced, I absolutely wanted to go and participate. And so I went with my wife and daughter and, and daughter-in-law and granddaughter um, and, and tried to make our way up uh, 42nd Street uh, in a huge and, and lively and really wonderful throng. And I didn't really think twice about it. Um, uh, as it happens, uh, some of us were photographed and, and appeared in the media. And again, I didn't think anything about it. Uh, but when the March for Science came up, our editor-in-chief decided that as an organization, uh, our, our uh, journalists uh, should not and were not allowed to participate as marchers in the March for Science. We were allowed to go and cover it and, and uh, interview people. But the rule, the, the rule at the magazine level was, no, as, as employees of Scientific American, you can't do this. So that is a more traditional. Uh, way of looking at, at uh, these issues. Um, it is, uh, for those of you who are too young to remember this person, there was a guy named uh, Ben Bradley, who was uh, an editor, managing editor, I think, at the Washington Post during the Watergate. Executive, executive editor, thank you, at, uh, during the Watergate years. And, um, and maybe you know what I'm about to say, whether this is true or not. But it is, it is said, and he, he, he uh, supervised the Watergate coverage. It is said that he refused even to vote in a secret ballot in elections because he feared that even having inside his head the fact that he voted for one party or the other. I think that was Downey. What's that? Yeah. See, that's why we have the audience. <laughs> Any, anyway, the point was he was also the Washington Post, yes? Yeah. OK. The, the, the point remains that even, so this is an extreme view, that the, even the knowledge that you voted for one party or the other might color your journalistic objectivity. Um, then we have uh, uh, another journalistic decision made by the Huffington Post during last year's campaign that every article um, about Donald Trump would have a note at the bottom reading, uh, reading, Donald Trump is a serial liar, rampant xenophobe, racist, birther, and bully who has repeatedly pledged to ban all Muslims, 1.6 billion members of an entire religion, from entering the US. So, so uh, uh, Downey and Bradley and, and those traditional journalists probably were spinning in their graves at this, this blatantly, um, uh, yeah, partisan. Is it partisan? I don't know. It's truthful. Um, but <laughs> but uh, what might seem to be a, a partisan statement um, it, right there in the newspaper. Uh, among scientists, um, we uh, heard a reference to James Hansen earlier who uh, 
uh, is one of the the uh, the founding um, fathers, I guess, because they were all fathers in those days, of of uh, modern climate science. Just a, 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 a towering figure in the in the field uh, who resigned from his uh, his job at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in part because he felt that it was inappropriate for him to pursue the amount of activism that he felt very moved to do based on what he had learned from the science um, uh, so that he'd go chain himself to nuclear plants or, or whatever, that sort of thing. Um, so there's, there's a scientist saying, I, I cannot be a scientist and an activist at the same time, and I, I will choose activism. Um, but then uh, we have Ayana, who, who wrote very publicly about her own decision uh, to march for science and to, to write very eloquently about the fact that as a scientist, but also as a human being, um, she could not not march. Um, and we had another uh, a scientist, a woman named Joan Strassman, uh, who's a microbiologist and member of the National Academy of Sciences at uh, Washington University, who wrote of the, uh, the first march, the, the, um, the women's march, uh, saying, I will march in Washington on January 21st, the day after the uh, inauguration, blah, 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 because the progress we have been made towards that dream, and, he, and she was talking about the I have a dream speech, the 1963 Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream speech, because that progress toward that dream is under threat. I will stand up for women, for people of color, for immigrants, for all marginalized voices, for universal health care, for the environment, for justice, and for science. So again, um, a scientist making a very activist statement um, and not feeling that it conflicted with her role as a scientist. And, you know, I think all of these decisions are, are defensible and legitimate. And so, I, again, there's no right answer to, um, to that question, where the line is and what is appropriate or inappropriate for scientists and journalists to do in the face of, of uh, today's conditions. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists to um, just tell us a little bit about how they feel about this. Is it, is it um, wrenching for you as a scientist or as a journalist uh, to imagine or to actually take the step of being an activist as well? And uh, it, if you choose activism as part of your, um, your public persona, do, uh, do you keep that entirely separate from your science or from your journalism? Do you uh, incorporated in some way, if only unconsciously, um, and I'm, uh, and I'm, I want you all to listen and think about how you uh, feel about those questions, both the the senior scientists and journalists in the room, and the people who are uh, who are just coming up, who are forming your own opinions. Okay, so Stevie, shall we start with you? Because I'm closest. Yes. <laughs> okay, so. I was thinking about this topic because an aspect of my work, uh, the, the bulk majority of my work is as a scientist. It's what I was working on right up until I got on the train to come here. That's what I spend 8, 10, 12 hours a day doing. Um, and then I fit in the other things that I care about somehow. And the other aspects of my work are um, are journalistic and, and on advocacy, but I realized that I entered, um, in thinking about these questions, I realized that I entered those aspects as a scientist. So I kind of, um, I remember when I, when I began doing journalistic work, we had interviews and um, somebody would say something like off the mic, they'd say like, oh, off the record, it's this, and me and my fellow co-host, also a scientist, we'd chuckle and be like, we're not, we're not journalists. Like, you don't, like, that's, that's fine. Um, because we kind of saw ourselves as science explainers instead and as um, providing a platform for scientists and experts, which, you know, as time went by, we realized we actually are, we are journalists in that capacity. So when I, like, how does this lead to the question? Um, I, I didn't participate in the March for Science. I, um, in the end, I, that decision was taken from me because I just didn't, I didn't have time. But when I um, enter, like I definitely am an advocate, but I consider myself an advocate for, for evidence, for, um, for I guess science, but I, when I think of um, 
advocate for science. I think of just being an advocate for um, the truth, I guess, which is um, maybe any journalist would see themselves as that as well. Um, so where I'm, where I'm getting with this, um, there, there are many, this is of course a very complicated question and there are many lines you can go down. Um, I do participate in advocacy and I do participate in journalism as a scientist, uh, but I, do, I, I am very careful because I um, am careful about how my audience um, sees me. Particularly as a journalist, I don't bring up my own politics. Um, I realize that I'm giving a platform only to um, certain people. So in that way, I'm presenting perhaps a bias. But um, where am I going with this? <laughs> uh, well, with the, well okay, but there's so much, but I, uh, what I'm trying to say is that I enter it, um, I enter it as a scientist. So I enter it um, not uh, trying, trying to advocate for science in, in all of these various regions. So in that way, I don't actually even um, see an issue, almost. Um, like the question kind of didn't come up until it was posed to me. And actually, um, just the last story is that being, when I was on the mic on the radio, I was uh, discussing a recent uh, a poll about vaccines. And I got a, and I was just describing, I was describing vaccines as safe and the, and the poll was asking people if they thought vaccines were safe. And I got a very angry caller um, who called in saying that I was advocating a political view and that I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, and I listened, I heard them out, and then I just basically said, this isn't, this isn't, this is political, but it's been, it's that it's a, it's that it's science, it's just been politicized. And so I enter it, this is what I mean when I say enter it as a scientist rather than from a political view. Great, thank you. We will come back to you. Ivan. Sure, so uh, this is a subject I've thought a lot about over the years um, in my own work, uh, certainly in, in my teaching at NYU, um, but in terms of specific comments to make, um, I think it, I've given it as much time as I was given in terms of the panel, which is a few hours. Mm -hmm. So uh, apologies for any, um, even more than average, many of my students or future students are actually in the room, they'll, they'll confirm that um, I ramble even under the best of circumstances. Um, I'll tell you a couple of sort of stories, and then I will uh, sort of uh, try and, and, and sum up a little bit, although uh, to me a lot of these issues are, are sort of rightfully incoherent and, and, le and best left to personal choice, and, and so I'll start there. Um, right after the election, we had a, uh, in one of our, our uh, retraction watches is virtual. We have, right now we have four full-time employees, and then me and Adam uh, Marcus, who's, uh, he and I are the co-founders. So we have these uh, weekly calls, actually twice a week now. And um, right after the election, we uh, had one of those calls and, and talked a little bit um, about the, at the time, the Women's March, which was sort of coming into a formation, I guess, because that was, you know, in, in right after the inauguration. And um, I, I'll, we had, a, I think, a really interesting discussion, and, and, and opinions were clearly mixed or divided and, and different, and that's good. Um, my, and, and I'm sort of, uh, for better or for worse, sort of the, the decider at, uh, at, at Retraction Watch, and I said, look, uh, this is a personal decision, I, but I, I, the only thing I would say is, if you can honestly, uh, and I do think that this is very possible to do, if you can honestly sort of say to yourself, I want to go to this and I am doing this because I am supporting uh, and advocating for you know, half or 51 percent of, of humanity uh, in a way that I don't consider particularly partisan, which is kind of how I would feel about it, uh, go for it. And, and, and so uh, one, one member of staff did, I believe, and, and the, another one or two but couldn't. Um, uh, and, and so that's sort of how we handled that in terms of the, and I, and I said the same thing about the March uh, for Science, and, and, um, and I'm going to get back to this sort of idea about advocating for science in, in a minute, but I want to tell a sort of a story that I looked at as a journalist into the workings of scientists and how they thought about advocacy that kind of knocked me out, or at least flummoxed, it's hard to knock me out at this point, I see a lot of really, really bad behavior and weird behavior, but uh, it sort of, it, it set me back a little bit and it surprised me. And, and I'll tell the hopefully vaguely short version, which is that um, many of you may know the name Mark Edwards. Mark was um, 
the, uh, he and his team of graduate students were instrumental in um, really alerting the world and improving really beyond better for the doubt that, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, I should say, and the, nobody in this case deserves the benefit of the doubt, uh, that the water in, in Flint was, uh, was terribly um, uh, polluted, uh, poisoned with uh, lead. Um, now, I, you can all read about that story in any number of venues, but w the reason I bring it up is that a group of engineers, so Mark's a, Mark is a, a water engineer, essentially. That's his by trade. And a group of engineers, in fact, one particular society, the editor of one of their journals, uh, Adam Marcus and I wrote about this in the conversation back in, I think it was January it was published. Um, they, he, the editor of one of their journals wrote this fairly strongly worded editorial saying that was really a bad idea. It was a bad idea for, for Mark to advocate and, and sort of take such an activist role the way he did. Um, you really should sort of do the, do the things the proper way and go through scientific channels and all of that. I mean, Mark is a, he's a genius grant award winner. This is not some, and I happen to think citizen scientists often have more to offer than some scientists working, but that's my own view. Um, but this is not someone random off the street. who's just a full professor and the rest of it. I um, mean, they said, you know, it could be really dangerous because people will say that's politicizing science and they will take away funding because they'll say you're just, you know, you're just politicizing science and next time the EPA has a grant to give out or something, they, they won't give it to you, which as a, according to the Washington Post, as was mentioned earlier today, they apparently won't do anyway. Um, so what actually happened was that the EPA created a $100 million grant and fund that then was given to people like Mark who study this stuff. And so not only was it actually, to me, sort of bizarre and unthinkable that you would think that, you know, advocating, doing research on an incredibly impoverished uh, and vulnerable population that had been screwed, I mean, really screwed, and I could use worse words, which I want in this company, but by uh, lawmakers forever, um, but they, they actually turned out to be wrong. They, they were literally wrong. That, that they it created funding rather than the opposite. So I think that one of the things that this comes to for me is, I, I don't see anything. I, I think a. I think it's important to remember that. Um, I don't think there's anything that isn't political anymore. You know, my my colleague at Jay Rosen, uh, my colleague at NYU, Jay Rosen, puts it much more eloquently than I will be able to, but. This sort of idea of a view from nowhere, which is you know, a phrase that he uses a lot, I don't know if he invented, if he created that, um, is, is just, it's, as my grandmother uh, would have said, um, uh, Narish kite, okay? It's, it's, some of you, I'm in New York, so that'll work, sort of. But <laughs> it's, it's uh, she was a Brooklyn native, I'm not. But um, it's nonsense, it's, it's uh, Yiddish for horseshit. Um, and you know, that's, you have to sort of think about that. The act of doing journalism is political. The act of being a science journalist instead of whether it was a business journalist or whether it was a political journalist, that is a political act. It may not be the same as, as ticking, you know, as whatever our electronic voting now is, but that is a political act, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so advocating for science, advocating for transparency, advocating for the public release of records, which we try and do at Retraction Watch, I have no issue with that. In fact, I think more journalists should be doing it. Um, and and I, I just think that uh, that's the way to sort of think about these things and to come up with your own sort of rubric, a defensible rubric for what you do, uh, but don't sort of be, I, I think, um, uh, afraid of uh, or concerned that, you know, well, this is the thing that will finally make a political. And the last thing I'll say, because I've gone on already, but the last thing I'll say is ask yourself, um, would I be asking myself the same questions about protesting, advocating against or for something, uh, if this were a, a, an administration that I generally agreed with or even voted for. Um, because I think, again, we heard earlier today that um, although it's this is sort of, and I'll use my vague medical training here uh, metaphorically, although this is sort of you know a fight against the media and a fight against transparency on steroids that we're witnessing now, we've seen that before. And would you have done the same thing and would you have advocated? And if the answer is no, then you probably shouldn't be doing whatever it is. If the answer is yes, then you really should be doing it. So I'll shut up. Great. Thank you. Brianna? Hi. Um, I feel like you all know what I think already because we had such a <laughs> wonderfully thorough introduction. But um, one of the things I think about a lot is the, the difference between something being political and something being partisan which kind of builds on what Ivan was saying. So this was something that we really struggled with conveying to the media when we were working on the March for Science because the march was political. 
because it, you know, what science gets funded, what science is used for policy making, what communities are served by this are all very political decisions. Um, are, are scientists even appointed to the scientific positions that exist in the government? These are political issues. Um, they're not necessarily partisan. So we would want a chief of science in federal agencies regardless of who's in office. And we would want data to be used to make policy decisions regardless of who's in office. And we should be upset if data sets start disappearing from government websites on climate change or endangered species and then conveniently you don't have to legislate using that data because it's gone. These are things that I think are should be of concern to scientists in general regardless of who's in power. Um, and it's the disappearance of data that really pushed me over the line to, to getting involved and helping to organize the March for Science. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there up front, is that there is a really big difference between what is political and what is partisan. And that's um, a lot of how I draw the line for myself of how I get involved. Um, the way that I uh, talk about a lot of issues is more about policy than politicians. Um, it's more about more about data and less about elections because the issues that I care about span a really broad spectrum. Um, and I found myself like really not weighing in um, on the election primaries and really talking about candidates at all, but more talking about the, po the policies that different um, politicians were supporting and what the impacts would be on the communities that I care about. Um, and so I think as a scientist, that's how I have decided to walk the line. Um, so, but at the same time, as a human who cares about people in the communities I'm a part of, who is a citizen, um, I'm definitely someone who votes. Um, and I, I take that role as a citizen really seriously. So I would think that I was shirking my responsibility as an American if I weren't engaged. Um, I think yes, there certainly is a sliding spectrum of what engaged means. Um, so, I th and I was really glad that the March for Science kind of instigated this conversation within the scientific community of where is that line for scientists. Um, and over a million people marched for science at 600 plus cities around the world and 300 partner organizations, but only about a third of those were scientists, which is still quite a lot. Um, and so I think when, when we're talking about uh, supporting evidence-based policy making and facts, um, for a lot of people, that's just what it came down to was saying like, we, the scientific method is really a useful way to understand the world and make decisions based on data. Why would we, why would we ignore that? Um, so it can be something just that fundamental. Um, so I guess I will uh, leave that right now, but I would, the last thing I would say was you mentioned um, in introducing me the work that I had done in the Caribbean, working with communities to develop ocean zoning plans uh, so they could sustainably use ocean resources in their waters. Um, and so I've spent the entire morning just in tears trying to get updates from Barbuda, from Montserrat, all these small Caribbean islands that were in the eye of Hurricane Irma, um, and then reading about um, this presidential administration wanting to defund NOAA satellites to help us you know, deal with that risk. Um, so when we think about science and whether or not it's political, um, there are also people who are affected by what science is funded, what science isn't funded, whether it's drinking water in Flint or hurricanes hitting our coasts. So um, I think it's really easy to talk about science in a vacuum, but science is done by people and it affects people and it's used by people. So, um, and, and we're all human. So it's just a matter of figuring out um, how to be responsible um, in our use of the facts without losing our humanity. Okay, thank you. Apoorva. Hi, so <clears throat> by way of uh, introduction, Spectrum is a new site f about autism for scientists. Um, but 
about 40% of our audience is parents. We don't write for them, but they come anyway. Um, and I think you probably know why. There's a lot of fake news about autism. And our claim to fame is that we are actually credible, we are science-based, we are rigorous. So we have to straddle this divide of writing for scientists and writing for parents. And of course, there's a Venn diagram there. Some of the scientists who work on autism are parents themselves, and parents. some of the parents um, of children with autism are extremely engaged in the science and up to date on all the latest research. But it does mean that because we are so close to scientists and because we are read by people who are really influenced by some of the things we write, we have to think that much harder about maintaining very clear lines between being journalists and being activists. And I would say we fall very much on the more traditional side that Mike referred to. Um, with this current administration, the way that we came to that decision making was partly after the March for, si March for uh, the Women's March in um, January. When the march was first announced, I think I, like a lot of other people, you know, got really swept up in this idea of marching for women. This was a humanitarian thing. This was, you know, I'm a woman, hear me roar, all of that. And I went with um, a fellow journalist and we didn't think that much about it. Um, but then when we got there, there were a lot of political signs and all of my old training sort of kicked back in and I found myself really thinking about, should I be here? Is this the right thing to do? And it's not that I hadn't thought about it at all before that. We actually discussed it in our team that I was gonna go and a couple of other people said they might also go and we sort of agreed that it was okay for us to go. So we had talked about it a little bit, but still actually going and sort of seeing what a political part also, um, politics also played a part in this. March, we, we did need to think a little bit more carefully about it. And then the March for Science came up. Um, and autism is already quite political. Um, you know, as Stevie mentioned, it's always coming up as a political topic. Hillary had a, a whole autism plan in her agenda even before the election. And then President Trump started to make some comments about the autism epidemic and vaccines and so on. So we needed to have a clear plan. and. When I thought back on why we had the rules we had always had, um, unspoken, but they existed, you know, they, it really goes back to the idea that this is, this is one point in time. I started reporting before President Bush came to power, and then when he came, there was a lot of outrage about the AIDS policies, you know, his introduction of abstinence only for grants, um, and I had already sort of walked this line. Granted, this was much more extreme, so, we revisited the whole thing, we thought about it again, and we have a scientific um, advisory, we have an advisory board of scientists and journalists. Um, in fact, Robin Moranz Hennig, Ivan Ransky, and David Sassoon, three of the people who are involved in these panels are all on our advisory board, and the fourth is um, Laura Helmuth, who's the science editor at the Washington Post. So, as you can see, I had some really good people to seek advice from, and so I, I wrote to them and I said, this is what I'm thinking, but what do you think? What should we be doing? Should we march in the March for Science? Should we walk the more traditional lines that journalists do? Um, I'm erring on the more traditional side, but let me know. Is this a whole new era, and should we be doing something different now? And the advice that I got from them more or less meshed with what we had already been thinking, that we should continue to be journalists, that we have chosen a role for ourselves on how we navigate these things. And there's a really good and important role for journalists to play um, at all of these times, but especially at times like this. So for the March for Science, for example, we um, commissioned a reporter to go report on the March for Science. We um, invited an autism researcher to write about why he chose to march. Um, and I won't say this isn't frustrating because we are also human beings and we are also citizens, as you said, and we of course have feelings. I'm not gonna pretend we are objective or that we don't have political feelings of our own, but um, we talked about how best we can serve our duty as journalists and not alienate these large swaths of our audience who actually need information from us and whom we should not alienate by advertising our political beliefs. So we decided to just do our job as journalists and contribute in that way. We did, you know, when President Trump made comments about autism epidemic, we did an explainer on, is there an autism epidemic? And that was one of the best performing articles we've ever done. Um, 
which goes back to the point that somebody was making last uh, panel about, you know, things don't have to be clickbait to do well. This was a very straightforward explainer. Um, and we did a piece on Betsy DeVos when she was uh, nominated as education secretary and what the autism community thinks about that and what impact that might have on education, you know, special needs um, education. And, you know, we did uh, a piece, an opinion piece on RFK Jr.'s supposed vaccine panel, which thankfully never went anywhere. So again, it's not that we don't have opinions, but there's a difference we felt between having an opinion personally and using our platform as journalists to shove that down other people's throats. We decided to take a more traditional approach to journalism to covering these topics in the most fair and rigorous way we could think of. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, in one, one way I regret that Andrew Friedman is not here, in addition to Ivan, um, because uh, climate coverage is, is one of those areas where this is, um, <sighs> this is pretty contentious. Um, and I forgot when I was uh, talking earlier about, about the, the people who have made decisions about whether they're, they're activists and journalists. I was also going to include uh, Bill McKibben, who was a journalist uh, for a number of years and then began writing about climate change and decided to leave journalism to become an activist and founded a, a, an organization uh, called 350.org that is, is absolutely, a, a, it puts on um, uh, demonstrations and, and it's, a, it's, it's a clearly a, um, an activist organization. But, um, but last year, the year before, he wrote a cover story for Rolling Stone with the headline, Global Warming's Terrifying New Math, Three Simple Numbers That Add Up to Global Catastrophe and Make Clear Who the Real Enemy Is. So now you have somebody who stepped away from journalism to be an activist, but now he's writing under the guise of a journalism. And, and it struck me, certainly, and I would have been interested to hear Andrew's take, and I'll be interested to hear the take of people in the audience on whether, whether that uh, sort of straddling a line, uh, that is presenting yourself as a journalist while you are uh, very clearly taking a um, um, a strong point of view, not just on the facts, but on the way to present the facts. And that's something that, uh, that uh, they talked about in the last panel. Um, you know, the, the idea that uh, what our role is, is as journalists, is it to, is it in fact simply to inform people and, and let them make their own decisions? Um, uh, or is it to uh, get facts into their heads and make sure that they are there. And that, that's, that's something I've wrestled with um, quite a bit. Um, Gavin Schmidt uh, asked a question in the last session about, um, about uh, headlines on the latest news story uh, that don't add up when you put them together, one headline after another, after another, after another, um, don't add up to knowledge on the part of the readers and the viewers. Um, and yet we are very resistant as journalists to looking at that and, and wondering whether we're doing something effectively. I, I, uh, I have been writing about climate in the way that uh, Porva describes, um, uh, writing about autism, for uh, more years than I am almost willing to admit. I wrote my first major story on climate change in 1987. Um, and I've been writing about it on and off ever since. Um, many uh, uh, with that same uh, idea that we present the facts and we simply uh, tell people what the science says and what it doesn't say, and we're, we're upfront and honest about it. And um, and I'm clearly not the only one. Um, Andy Revkin wrote about climate for many years for the New York Times. Uh, many many people have written responsible, um, straightforward, engaging, factual stories about climate change and why climate scientists take it very seriously. And yet, 30 years after that last story I wrote, um, that, that first story I wrote, we are still uh, not dealing with this at all. So have, have we as journalists been failing to do our jobs? And I don't mean to get back into, you know, to re-litigate uh, the last panel. But it's, it, it, it is a question that, 
for me as a journalist, worries me a little bit. That that is is it not appropriate to start uh, to be a little less even-handed and less sort of uh, low-key and thoughtful when um, when people are not absorbing really important information. What do you think? Can I um, address I'm, that? That's what I'm hoping for. I'm not sure that I would say that's even-handed. I don't, I don't want to confuse what I was saying with false equivalency, because I think we are very careful to say this is what the science says. And even, but I think we do always want to be thoughtful, because even you're not thoughtful, and when you are just impassioned, shall we say, it's very easy for counter arguments to take the wind out of your sails. And I, I think if you have the weight of the evidence behind you and you take the time to be thoughtful and to be rigorous, Maybe it's slower, but it sticks longer. And that, Phoebe, I think, wants to make a point. But yes. I, I, do, I, I do think, at least in autism research, maybe I'm overly naive and optimistic, but I, I feel there it has been progress in more people understanding that vaccines are not some terrible, awful thing. I, it's been slow, but um, I've been running the site for 10 years, and I would say over this time, it, it's clear that science is slowly winning on that front. Climate change, I agree, is more urgent in many ways. It's more global, it's massive, and I, I don't write about that, and I don't have strong feelings about that, but I think it's in the same way, you know, if it's, if people can come to you and say, well, you know, you believe this other thing, and you, you just don't like Trump, and you just, you know, you're just biased, and they don't have to believe anything you say. And I'm not sure that that gets you anywhere either. So um, what I've been thinking about as I've been listening, something that I think about constantly in being um, a communicator in general, whether it's um, on a particular um, scientific topic or a policy topic, is, is um, the listener going to be actually hearing me? Like, are they? Are they actually going to um, take what I'm saying? And something that I, something that I'm wonder because I absolutely think that um, more scientists should speak up, and scientists have a very important voice. And often um, the greater public takes um, scientists' silence as um, sort of like having nothing to say, and at, and it's in fact the exact opposite. I think scientists just prefer the safety of their lab most of the time, and it takes a little bit of a push to, to go out of that. However, um, like for example, um, you mentioned a scientist in, uh, who was speaking out on about Flint, right? Um, something that I wonder is, is um, whenever, like how, how you speak out, whether or not you um, kind of push past the bounds of your expertise if you're if you're worried about um, how everybody is, how the audience is, is taking what you're saying, if, they're, if you're worried that in being just kind of, um, I maybe would say a harsher advocate uh, or stronger advocate, then um, maybe your audience won't hear you. Question from the audience. And thank you all for participating in this very introspective panel. My name is Annie Schragner, and I run my own website called millennialmanifest.com. And um, I, I write Q&A style articles about young people showing the world they can change it through activism and volunteering and all that good stuff. And I found that activism is universal, but at the same time, it is also very divisive. And what you said about silence does not equal not having anything to say, I found that a lot of the people I've interviewed often feel very misunderstood by others about their intentions, especially particularly members of older generations. And I was curious about what your thoughts are on how we can implement an edge into our activism that breeds inclusivity and intergenerational understanding and participation. I think there's a... Um a pretty strong generational shift that's happened as far as um, what I've seen within the scientific community and younger scientists being um, less wary about crossing that line wherever they think that it might be. Um, there's a lot more scientists um, 
doing applied research and really engaged in conservation, for example, in my field. Um, they're not just saying, oh, all the fish are gone. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, oh, I wonder what the policies would be that could potentially bring the fish back and, and address the food security issues that result from this. So I think, um, but at the same time, as part of my dissertation, I read every single paper on small-scale fisheries on coral reefs all over the world um, and analyzed them all for what types of data they were collected and what types of recommendations people were making. And there were still... Um, about a third of articles that made no policy recommendations, even though they were, you know, talking about the the decimation of an entire ecosystem livelihood and, and source of food for these communities. Or they would just say, like, and so we should have a marine protected area, even if their research had nothing to do with it, because that was the safe thing to advocate for. Um, so I think... Um, as far as your question about uh, this sort of intergenerational topic, um, I've definitely seen a very big shift. Um, a lot of my mentors and advisors have encouraged me um, to be more politically engaged and to do more in policy. Um, and I think a lot of them are starting to get involved later in life and, and sort of wish they had sooner. Um, because the ecosystems that they loved are falling apart. And they basically, uh, what they say is like, we've been writing ever more refined obituaries for the things that we study. And is, uh, just to, to interrupt, is there, is there um, presumably science, uh, the, the culture of science, when, when these people were, were young researchers, basically said you don't talk oh, about Oh, yeah, policy. for sure. But, but was it... Is it your understanding, and maybe some of the older scientists here can say um, uh, from their own experience, was it, is it your understanding that it, this was just something that was assumed, um, or was were there consequences if people would do stuff like that? There are definitely consequences as far as like tenure and your relationship with your you know colleagues. Right. But I think um, there's something really interesting to think about in this regard, which is um, you know not any one person has to fill all of these roles. Just because I'm a scientist and also can be outspoken doesn't mean every scientist has to be outspoken about the ways in which data should be used. Um, and I think a lot about that because we're in this context of thinking about science and journalism, that one of the real tensions for me, and I know for a lot of my colleagues, is science is slow. Right, so like I can't always wait to publish a peer-reviewed scientific article and then hope someone reads it and then hope that influences policy. That takes years, um, and I sometimes am jealous of journalists who can go to an event or read a paper and publish something on it within days. Um, and so for me, I actually see a lot less urgency for journalists across that line than I do for scientists. Also because we're in an era now where there are very few sources that are trusted. Um, and scientists, museums, aquariums, science centers, what you see on a plaque in those places is still trusted as true. Um, and so we as a scientific community actually have a lot of credibility. Um, and so we don't want to lose that by overstepping this line. But we also don't want to not use it by not talking about these things. So when you were talking about you know, responding to p statements by politicians and looking into whether or not there was data to support these statements, you could argue that that's a political decision because not engaging at all would be an alternative. Even though you're not supporting you know, a particular politician, you're basically like fact checking them. So I think how we define what's political and how we define what's activism, um, I think that line has started to shift. Like I said, like I, I draw the line a lot of the times at partisanship. But I mean, even if we look at the subtitle for this event, Science, Journalism, and Democracy, colon, grappling with a new reality, I mean, I think where that line is for a lot of people has shifted lately, and especially for younger generations. Thank you. Just to interject quickly, I think what Ivan was saying, that all journalism is political, is actually true, because that is the crux of what journalists are supposed to do, is when a politician makes statements, check the facts, correct the record. Great. Thank you. Mr. Tenner. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ed Tenner, uh, independent writer. Um, 
we've been uh, talking about politics and we've been talking about science, uh, but we haven't been talking about political science. So I'd like to uh, interject a little bit about that and uh, ask a question. Uh, I also want to uh, recall, I just uh, double checked this, that uh, those photographs of how the uh, America looked on the eve of the EPA were taken by the EPA that was uh, called into being by Richard M. Nixon, who praised it in his, uh, in his inaugural address and, and declared a new era for America. So that shows something about how far we've come in uh, partisanship in the environment. My question, is, though, is based on uh, recent work by the political scientist Brendan Nyan of uh, Dartmouth. And Nyan's research suggests that when people uh, are confronted by facts that seem to contradict their values, uh, they, um, they, they often are reinforced in their, uh, in their, in their prejudices. Uh, and I don't think this is, a, I don't think this is a, a necessarily grounds for despair, and this is something that has gone, it went back really to the 1950s and the studies of uh, cognitive dissonance, for example. So my question is this, uh, do you think that it's, it's possible by investigating the research in political science and the sociology of beliefs of, of identity for journalists to um, interested in communicating scientific truth to work out better strategies for persuading the, uh, those who have so far not been persuaded and who are so committed to their identities that they are really you know, closing their ears to the facts. Yeah, this is, uh, this is something that came up uh, in the last panel as well in a, in a somewhat different form, but it's a question that's always fascinating to me, so I want to hear. So I, I, want to, I want to respond as directly as I can to the question, um, but also, if I may, separate it from this idea of persuading. I, I think that um, the only thing I'm trying to persuade people to do is to well, first to read whatever it is my staff and my students are writing, um, but after that, uh, I'm, I'm trying to persuade them to actually just sort of become better informed. And I think we, we do have to be careful there when we use the word persuade. Um, so this did come up in the, last, in the last panel, and I think that, I mean, I think it was Ginny Hughes who uh, referred to the work of Dan Gahan. Um, little plug here, but Dan and um, uh, Dietram Schiffele and uh, Kat Kathleen Hall Jameson uh, got a bunch of us together, and then we we each wrote chapters of a of a textbook that came out a few months ago. That uh, it's an Oxford handbook of um, the science of science communication. Um, Nyhan does great work. I mean, Kahan does great work. I mean, Conahan, Kahneman and Tversky before that. Uh, Dietram and Dominique uh, Brassard did terrific work at at Wisconsin. I think though that, to, and and this is no disrespect to what they do. It's it it's still very much in its infancy in the sense that. We're at the stage of, I, I, and to, to sort of maybe paraphr not paraphrase, but sort of take a parallel to something Ayana was saying, we're at a stage of actually realizing there's an issue. Um, so we're writing everybody, you know, writing the obituaries of all of the, the fish or, or what have you. Um, we haven't actually come up with any ways to solve that problem yet. And, you know, I've read Nyhan, I've read a lot of these and, and tried to understand them. I may not understand them completely. Um, you know, to use, to sort of mix um, scientific metaphors, uh, sort of, uh, political science needs to sort of do an RCT, a randomized controlled clinical trial, and actually try and figure out what actually works. I'm not saying they should go do this. I'm saying if we're going to treat that as evidence and treat that as something we should be incorporating into our work or that anyone should be incorporating to his or her work, then we need some evidence that it actually is going to change anything. Um, because I think this very same forces that will basically have people um, revert to whatever means or, or even strengthen whatever ideas, sort of whether they're right or wrong, they had that were preconceived um, is only going to, you know, so we, we shouldn't do the same thing. And I think, that, you know, we just, we need better evidence. I, I, I just also want to add an excellent point. I mean, this, this research really is in its infancy and people are, are still trying to figure it out. Um, but I also think that journalists are very resistant to the idea that that we will be presented a, we feel, you know, we're independent. We, you know, we write the truth as we understand it in a way that we think is, is, uh, is most effective um, and most compelling. And the idea that, uh, that we will have, we will look to, to um, uh, social science research to tell us how to write stories 
uh, in a better way that's more effective somehow. I think journalists would be incredibly resistant to that. Um, OK. And, and I'm not sure that's a good thing, but that, that's sort of the culture of, of journalism. Can I just add something quickly to sure. that? Which is just, I'm, what I'm wondering is that if somebody was a scientist coming at it, like coming at um, communication and journalism, like maybe from a science background, I actually have the feeling that they'd be extremely receptive uh, to, to um, evidence, but mostly because you enter it, often people enter it as with almost a blank, blank slate when coming from science. You mm -hmm. don't, you um, often ha don't, you're often hungry for, for ways to, to communicate better. And if there's somebody presents you with like, oh, well, this works, then. Um, right, right. But, but you know, we think of ourselves as artists. Artists of the written word. And the, I think and you raise a good point, though, because she, she's talking about scientists yes, becoming writers, yes. which is very different than journalists doing their jobs. Um, and just I and I think there's certainly a parallel there with um, you know do we do we look at how many people like or click or share our article? That's data about how well received it is. And I think most people who publish things online look at that yep. as evidence. Um, and so I I've certainly taken that feedback. Um, so it's just. I, I often say that if I really wanted to be effective in conservation, I should have studied psychology because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really like a, a, a chain, how do we shift human behavior question. Um, there's, there's a ton of important science to be done, but like there are some very basic things that we need to do to sustain our planet that we're not doing, um, that we already, we already have many more solutions than we're applying. So I think there is certainly a role, a really important role for social science. And another one of the things I would um, reflect back on that question about the intergenerational shift is that um, I've seen a lot more scientists doing interdisciplinary research, which I'm really heartened by. Um, a lot of my colleagues, myself included, have studied behavioral economics and anthropology and sociology at the same time as we're studying marine biology and ecology and fishery science, because it's just a really crazy puzzle. Um, so if, if the goal is sustainable fisheries, um, the science that you need to get there is actually quite diverse. Great, thank you. I'd like to, is this mic on? Could you turn on the mic, please? Is it okay? Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for a fantastic session. I apologize that I'd had to miss parts of the session. So if I, what I'm asking has already been covered elsewhere, just go on to the next question. My question is directed to the journalists. How is it possible for scientists to help journalists broaden the scope of problems that they consider for their attention? I'd like to mention two specific examples of topics arising in science that get very little press. One is uh, hunger and the other is unintended pregnancy. Uh, the only mention that I heard of food was in Dr. Johnson's comments that if you destroy a fishery, you destroy people's food security. That's the only mention of food I heard. Yet, we have about 800 million people who are chronically hungry, disproportionately children. Those children, because they're malnourished, in utero and for the first three years, suffer permanent brain damage, which prevents them from learning if and when they get to school. One in seven households in the United States is food insecure, which means by the US Department of Agriculture definitions, they don't have enough money to buy the food they need at some point during a year. And at the same time, we have a glut of grain production by American farmers who can't afford the storage prices, so they're dumping the grain. We have an unprecedented famine in Yemen, which is not getting coverage. And so there are all these pieces that get, as far as I can see, virtually no press attention while we talk about climate change and rich people's diseases. <laughs> 
And I can't comprehend why the focus in the journalistic community wears a set of blinders like that. A second example, I'll, I'll be very brief. A second example is very widespread unintended pregnancy. And how do we know a pregnancy is un unintended? We ask the woman, did you intend to get pregnant? 41% of the time, worldwide, worldwide, the pregnancy is unintended. In the United States, you want to guess what it is? We're a rich, educated country. It's 49%. One in two. The consequences of unintended pregnancy are not desirable either for the mother, for the family, for the country, or for the child. Right. And we don't pay attention. There are probably other people here who have other ideas. But how can we get these things on the agenda? These are scientific problems, and we're not dealing with it. OK, journalists. <laughs> Defend yourselves. I'll give it a shot. I'm not, I'm not going to sort of speak specifically to any particular problem. I'm, I'm often reminded, so I, I um, some of you may know I actually finished, I, I went to medical school, finished medical school. I, I obviously no longer practice medicine, but um, I'm often reminded that there is a sort of paragraph that occurs in op-eds pretty much at least once a month, if you look hard enough, that says, medical students don't ever learn anything about this. They spend 12 minutes on average through their all educations on X, and that's a crying shame. And the, it kind of is a crying shame, except that it also is what it really is, is the attention, de not the attention deficit, but the sort of attention, um, the, help me with the economic term, scarcity that we're talking about. There are a billion things that we could all be covering every day. And you're right, we, make, we, we choose priorities. Are we choosing the right priorities? I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we are. I'm going to tell you that there is some mix of important, um, you know, time sensitive, newsy, um, and just personal interest. Um, there are those of us who may be more interested in certain issues than others, of course. Um, but I think that you, you have to look at, again, if you want to get those onto the right, you, you can sort of point to the media and say, how come they're not being covered? But I think you can also just sort of take things into your own hands. I think that there are lots of ways to get stories and messages out there. We're hearing from two people. I mean, you're pointing this at the journalists. I'm not going to point it at my, you know, two uh, co-panelists here because Bring I. Bring it on. No, my, my, <laughs> my, no, my, my point is like, we all have a voice. There's this thing called the internet, and it's it's not such a bad thing if we're all, you know, using it in whatever way we want. Uh, don't think about it as broadcast. Think about a conversation. You always have to say that too. But I think I'm, I'm going to also say something that I'm. I, the, anyone who who you know knows some of my other work, like Embargo Watch, will. No is a little bit of a of a hot, you know my my one of my pet my hobby sort of issues, which is that journalists have allowed themselves um, and journals have willingly and and quite frankly I'm not sure always honestly uh, done the corralling here, but journals have allowed themselves to be corralled into reporting on individual studies on uh, and so if there wasn't an individual study on teenage pregnancy or hunger in the New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA last week, then guess what? Nobody's going to cover that issue. And so that's... But that's um, and, and if you don't cover it immediately, you lose your window. Right. And Carl will uh, probably correct me here. Ho hopefully will correct me because I usually get my basic biology wrong. But I, I think that, that would, that's either commensalism or parasitism or symbiosis. I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> but it's something where, honestly, journalists and journal editors and the people who run journals and own journals and universities and all of that have kind of all decided that's okay. They've all decided that, you know what, it's easier if we just know what happens every week or nowadays every 20 minutes or whatever it is. And, you know, that's why you don't get a real, you get a real posture, you get a real sort of narrow slice because it's actually what those journals have decided. And now let me flip it back and say it ain't all the journalists' fault because what those universities and journals have done, now particularly the journals, but have... Basically, they've corralled their scientists and said, don't talk to anybody until you've published that peer-reviewed paper. Because if you do, we're not going to publish it. And guess what? You're not going to get tenure if you're going to get published. That's this wonderful thing that I always like to say, because it's a fun word, especially as a verb, called the Ingelfinger rule. Um, and so 
I, I won't use it as a verb. That's that that would be gross. <laughs> the so you have this sort of bizarre and 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 completely foreseeable had anyone thought to think about it system an ecosystem that has that has been built up, um, and that's actually you know a lot of the reason why you don't see what you don't see. However, there are other reasons, and I again I think some of those are solvable by people just taking to the internet streets. I mean, go for it. I have a, a quick anecdote along those lines. The first time I ever tried to publish an op-ed, it was um, based on um, a really big report, uh, 40 years of data on the Caribbean's coral reefs, a huge meta-analysis, 130 scientists, 40 years of data, um, trying to understand the, the different trends in coral and fish and algae and water quality and, and all of that. I mean, pulling data out, like, written in pencils and notebooks that were falling apart that we were finding in people's labs. Um, and putting this all together in this big report, it took three years to produce. It was by the um, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, so 130 scientists put this out, and we think, oh, we should write an op-ed for the New York Times. That would be great. Um, but we're all kind of, like, exhausted from finishing the report so we don't do it right away. So 40 years of data, 130 scientists meta-analysis, a week after it's been published is already old news. Um, and so we were very lucky um, to have Andy Revkin help us figure out how to tie this back into the news cycle because Noah was just about to list certain coral species as endangered so we could just like add a sentence to the intro and voila, mm -hmm. it gets published as mm -hmm. an op-ed. Um, and so that was a really formative experience to me seeing like you spend three years writing something and if you don't publish about it fast enough or get someone to write about it fast enough, like that's it. And so the lesson that I learned from that was like, that's when you pull an all nighter. Like that's when you stay up and make sure that your science isn't a tree that falls in the, in the, in the forest, right? That's when you cancel your meeting and call the journalist back when they wanna interview you. So I think there is definitely a really important role for scientists to play in, in helping to get the word out there, not activism, not political, just making sure that your message gets out. Right, another, another thing um, uh, directly responsive to the, to the question is that um, the, the problems that, that uh, our questioner described are ongoing problems. They are not, they're not something yeah. new. There's nothing new about them, in fact. And, and if there's not a report, for example, uh, that, that our, our journalists can point to and say, this is new. You know, there's a new report that um, things don't get reported on. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded that uh, during the Ebola outbreak in 2014, how many people died overall? 10,000, 20,000, 20, something like that, right? Um, and it was absolutely screaming front page headlines every day for a month. And, and when, when, when like three cases came to the US, oh my god, it was just insane. So there's the, the, uh, the sort of uh, chauvinism aspect of it as well. You know, if it's in Africa, it's a big story. If it's... Might even be racism. What's that? <laughs> might, might even be, might even be. This um, is an important point, I think, is that does the audience actually want to read this? Because as Kendra said in the previous panel, at Popular Science, when somebody writes about, she writes an article about climate change, she has to hide that in the headline because people don't click on it. So right. when you already have these very small teams at, most places don't even have science desks anymore, but the few journalists who can write about science, are you gonna write something that is going to reach a broad audience and seems important and urgent, or are you going to write about something that doesn't have a fresh peg, is probably going to take weeks and weeks of your work and doesn't have an audience. Right, and 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 what I was going to contrast that uh, with was the with the coverage of the, of that outbreak, and the fact during that during the I don't know was it six months that it that lasted, uh, probably um, two hundred thousand people, ballpark, very ballpark, in Africa died of malaria, but two hundred thousand people die every six months of malaria in Africa. So. It's not new, so what are you going to say about it? It's still happening, and 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 that that is a, just a weird thing that that um, that journalism does, um, you know. And, and the same is true, you know. How many people die of diarrheal diseases every year? A million people, something like that, um, in places that have don't have good water supplies. But that's not news. It happens every year. 
So we don't write about it unless there's a news peg. And unless I be just, you know, the black person yelling racism into the microphone and not explaining what I mean, um, I would say I think it's really important when we're talking about what issues do and don't get covered that we think about who are our journalists and who are our scientists, mm -hmm. right? Like if we don't have diversity in every sense of that word within these fields, then there will definitely be a lot of things that don't get the attention that they need. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's something, yeah, um, we should go to another question, but that's something that we don't think about even now, even, even today, um, nearly enough. So thank you for reminding us. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, when in 2015, the Associated Press announced that they would no longer use the phrase climate denial or climate denier. Uh, they would instead use uh, uh, language more like uh, persons who don't recognize established climate science. Uh, they felt that the use of the word denier or denial was um, uh, had an activist connotation or, right. or a partisan connotation. Right. Uh, so I'd be interested to know what your opinion of that is and how the power of specific language affects how science journalists do their work. Yeah, bringing us back to the actual topic, so that's, that's good. Um, so what do you all think? I know, I mean, we don't have a climate uh, journalist up here. Um, to me, it's like the, the distinction between like, you know, racist white people and alt-right. I mean, that's like the modern day equivalent, right? Like words really do matter. And are we giving people overly generous labels that like completely mask mm -hmm. um, what we're actually talking about? Like, are we just glossing over things and like just h hiding the actual meaning by creating these very delicate terms? Um, I think that's something that we definitely need to think about a lot. Are we are we providing an echo for those or not? And and how does that legitimize things um, that are not supported by science? I just thought about it. You're right. <laughs> I mean, you're, 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 and that's the way I feel about that. Yeah, it's huge. We, I mean, we don't write about climate science, but it's vaccine stuff is very similar. Yeah. So our policy on that is we don't even talk about them. We don't need to honor this group by pretending that they have a real leg to stand on. So. We, when we write about things like vaccines, it's vaccines have nothing to do with autism. Very simple. They don't have a nice cute name to go by. They don't have mm -hmm. a nice identity mm -hmm. to unify them and talk about together. They just are, you know, people who don't believe in science. That's it. I think you wanted to. Well, I, I was just going to say that, I mean, I think that's an interesting anecdote. I also think that it, what we're seeing today is things have gone the other way. Um, and so, you know, the New York Times, um, and, and, you know, to be fair, many critics would say that they sort of waited until the horse was, you know, had jumped off the cliff miles away from the barn, but um, <laughs> it sort of started calling, you know, statements by Trump what they are. And, and HuffPo, you quoted Michael from the, you know, the sort of dis disclaimer or whatever you call it, yeah. the end of a, of a story. So um, I don't know, it would, I, I I don't. I don't read minds. Um, I mean, even though I was, a, I was a partially trained psychiatrist, but I, you know, I, I would. W I would love to know. You know, if you said to the, to the AP now, what, what would you make that same decision? Um, would they? So I, I don't know. It's interesting to watch. Um, the uh, uh, the um, oh, I had something great to say, and then I forgot. <laughs> Damn, hit where that happens. I have something. Great. Um, I think along the lines of like how we're talking about different groups' views and whether or not how we're titling that, I think it's also really important to think about how we use language more generally and how we use scientific language in particular because there are a lot of scientific terms that have very different popular meanings. Um, and the one that comes to mind to me in terms of climate science is feedback loops, um, which most people think of as like maybe a good thing, not like glaciers melting, water freshening, like shutting down the thermohaline circulation, terrible disaster. Like that's not what people think when Especially they hear call it a positive feed. Positive. They're like, oh, positive feedback <laughs> right, loops. Exactly. That sounds great. Exactly. That sounds fine. So I think um, when we're thinking about like how we use language, um, there's a much bigger discussion to be had about like how we can be really careful, not just to be accurate, but to be clear. Right. Right, and, and um, to the point about, about um, uh, words like denier or, or, uh, or uh, you know, naming or not naming people who are, are wacky on vaccines or, 
Uh, you know, it's something that we don't even think about with in other areas of of, uh, of science journalism. So, so when I write a story about cosmology, for example, and we talk about um, we talk about uh, General relativity and and you know Einstein's theories and the, you know the, the things that govern how we, we think about the universe. Um, there are people who have you know are, uh, have credentials and are on faculties. A very small number of people who say no, no, Einstein was a crackpot. It's not has nothing to do. It's all bogus. There were there were Einstein deniers, right? Um, and there are people who uh, there are quantum mechanics deniers. Um, never have I included them in a story. Kind of like to be a fly on the wall at the like Einstein deniers club meeting. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah. You know, yeah, and they awkward. exist just as just as, <laughs> as this tiny handful of, of climate denying scientists exists. But in those fields, we don't feel that we're obliged to air their views. Well, something you're doing there um, is is well, it's easy when you're talking about cosmology because it's like maybe if you chose a topic that was the least political, right. that would be what it. That would be what it is. Right. Um, so I found that um, when I talk about vaccines, I actually, in a way, when I and when I enter it as a scientist, I actually am kind of just doing kind of a disassociation with the politics of it, and I'm just like like in um, Spectrum magazine, you're kind of pretending, or at least in, in my case, I'm pretending that the politics um, aren't even there. I'm just going to speak about the science of it, uh, even though I know very well that it's there. And I just, um, I, I am hopeful that it, the audience hears it, hears it that way as well. Right, right. And, but you could be accused of activism by leaving those voices out, which is, which is nonsense, but. Our stance is that this is the science side. Right. right. We're writing about science. We're not necessarily champions of scientists, but we are champions of the facts and the science. And if you disagree with that, then don't read us. Right. Or go fund your own science like they do for climate. <laughs> oh, hi. So my name is Hussein Mohsen. I'm a PhD student, and I do computational genomics. So the, pan the entire panel talked actually about getting into politics from science. I'd like to know your opinions on doing it the other way around. And by that, I mean doing science from a political perspective. And this means encouraging political debates in scientific labs and encouraging a scientist to take a decision on whether she or he will take part in a certain project depending on who's funding the project and how the science is going to be used. Uh, and as Stevie knows, we were talking about this right before the panel, this is not common in scientific communities, in many scientific communities. So what do you think about this? Can I just... I, I want some clarity, because uh, when, you, when you started to say may, deciding whether to work on a particular project depending on who's funding it, I don't know a scientist who hasn't decided you know, to do a particular project whether or not it would get funded. So I take it you don't mean that. You um, mean how the, you know, how the information or the, mm -hmm. the knowledge gained or the, the, the data might be used? So I'm mostly talking about young scientists who usually work on projects uh, scientific projects, and they mostly focus on the narrow science context and ignore, or they're not fully aware on who's funding the project or how the science is going to be used. Some scientists, for example, don't want to be another, take part in another Manhattan project, just like some scientists later regretted that. And that could be a larger example, but this could be recurring in many scientific fields. Well, it's, it's definitely occurring in scientific fields. I mean, I think I listened to a podcast the other day about using CRISPR, um, which I'm sure you know very well, uh, in, in genomics to um, mess with uh, genes of, of babies. You know, every like maybe people have seen Gattaca, like <laughs> where the story of Brave New World, or no, maybe you're on book, but uh, where, where it ends there, um, that this is, this is absolutely still being done. And I think a lot of scientists also kind of rationalize where this is going because they're just so excited about the possibilities, which um, hearing, hearing anecdotes from those who worked in the Manhattan Project, it was a similar kind of excitement, not thinking more broadly. And I actually think that this is, um, I think this is horrible. <laughs> I think that scientists are like, you're, you're also a human and um, you might try and think of yourself as an unbiased computer that goes throughout your work, but actually that's impossible. 
and you live in the world still and the stuff that you do impacts people and um, you should absolutely be thinking about that. Um, just like Ivan said, I mean, I, I, I also think that all of science is political. Um, whenever I, I, I work in a group called Princeton Citizen Scientists and um, it's a group entirely of, of scientists who, um, who now we're working on political issues and thinking about the uh, ways to advocate for evidence-based policy and various issues. And um, I sat there in the group and I didn't hear anybody bring up things like gender issues or, um, or food policy or like, or like hunger issues or just there are so many things that were neglected because the scientists didn't think of, like thought of them as being not scientific or like not under a scientist purview. And um, I pushed back very, very hard. I challenged anybody to name, name something that we think of as purely political and I could absolutely name you some science that, um, that is being done around that or a way it, it is uh, where there is data that could be affected or that is, that is behind that or that is part of it. So um, I think it's a really, really important issue. Um, with many scientists, I find that I just need to talk to them about it a little bit and then they kind of stop and kind of realize perhaps what's going on, but maybe that's um, a little bit too small scale. Hi, I'm Pravita, editor and writer from Audubon Magazine. Um, do you ever think that you could be so resolute in avoiding hints of advocacy or hot takes um, in your work where you even veer to the other side where you're falsely playing devil's advocate or it's being non-factual or even irrelevant? And if so, how do you avoid that? You're looking at me, so I'm assuming this is for me. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I don't think that that's happened so far because I think I, we begin with facts. So it's not so much in opposition to being an activist. It's keeping the focus on the facts rather than on opinion. So th there isn't as much danger of losing your way because you're not defining yourself as what you're against rather than what you want to stay focused on. Um, I think there are very rarely topics that we are so deeply passionate about that we're trying really hard not to even talk about it. I mean, you know, the, the, the recent events of this last year are, you know, remarkable. But again, I, I want to go back to the point I made originally, which is this is not the first time this has happened. I mean, the, you know, when I wrote about AIDS, the stuff that the Bush administration did also had my blood boiling. And, you know, there, there are other, many other instances over the years, you know, they had a ban on stem cell research back then. And there's been other instances of science being sort of ground down by political agendas. And I think, you know, as long as you keep your focus on what does my audience need to know about this? What do my readers need to know about this? What is correct about this? Where is the science wrong? We, are there objections? You know, do they have merit? Or is this a flawed logic that they're using to further a political agenda? As long as those are the questions you're asking, I think um, you, there's less risk of, of losing your way. OK, you're next. What's going on, everybody? <laughs> Justin Schaefer. Uh, I run an online platform called Fascinate, which is uh, mostly comprised of underrepresented students who like to talk about science and spread that literacy to people who may not have it. And so a lot of us partook in the March for Science, and we really appreciated it. But one of the criticisms I've heard for the March for Science was that uh, it was essentially a science parade. You know? uh, and I mean, I can kind of understand that side of the argument. I, I've never really seen before anyone saying, what do we want? Facts, how do we want it? Peer-reviewed research, <laughs> like chanting that enthusiastically. So uh, it, was, it was a really interesting uh, contrast, but I guess my question is, and, and I always am trying to advise uh, this, this younger group of folks that I work with who are constantly talking about the issues and maybe even participating in marches about the issues, what do we do after that? What our, what are, like figure out ways to actually solve the problem, because getting 100 shares on your post about this topic doesn't solve it. So uh, my question for you all then is, is what do we do? What do we follow up with something like a March for Science? Uh, for those of us that are more on the active side of the spectrum that is science activism. I have one like, thing to, to start maybe the conversation on this is definitely don't, um, 
allow anybody to be belittled by saying something like, this is just a parade. Um, I mean, activism has been uh, tried to be belittled for ages, so that's definitely um, not something to be to be listened to, for sure. Um, this is this, and this question of of what to actually do is a great one. <laughs> um, at least I've I've talked to to scientists who went to the March for Science and um, were. And just after the election as well, just in general, we're very pumped to do something. Uh, one of the biggest things that I've recommended and that I try and live by is just to continue having conversations and never try never to tire of it. Um, having conversations with, with anybody who's willing to listen, that's again, extremely small scale, but then um, broader speaking out, um, like going to a radio station, just trying to speak to anybody who would generally especially people who would generally not hear you, is something that um, I would just continue to do again and again. Um, like, it might be slow, but keep pushing for sure. I guess uh, sort of fairly generally, because it's not necessarily about activism, but uh, I'll pick up on something Ayana was talking about, her, your, your experience with colleagues trying to write an op-ed about something. and realizing, oh, wait, we really had to have done that. And you know, you, you, you recovered from it, obviously, and you had other ways to deal with it. Um, play a long game. I mean, this is true, I think, of anything. Just play a long game. And like, actually think about strategy and think about the fact some of what you're going to do is going to fail. Um, and in fact, if you don't fail, you're probably not trying hard enough. Um, I sound right now like a football coach, so I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna try and turn this into something useful. but. Um, you know, things don't happen when, when, you, when you sort of create a big event. I mean, that's great, you know, again, if that's what your goal is. Um, but that has to sort of be the punctuation in a much longer, you know, plan, a much longer strategy. And um, journalism, I mean, is the same way. If you take every little bite at every little apple and then just throw the rest of the apple on the ground, um, you, you just sort of, you end up... <laughs> This is why my students know I, I really need to stick just to baseball metaphors because I don't know what you end up with. You end up with a bunch of <laughs> like half eaten apples on the ground. But um, <laughs> yeah. So okay. So like I was saying, I yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Waste. Everybody, chuck an apple. Um, so anyway, I think you know you just you've got to sort of how does that fit into what you're doing, right? And so you know again, I'm not criticizing you for. I mean, you learn now, so you'll you'll sort of next time I assume you'll sort of have a plan for writing that, uh, that op-ed, like what is that? And you know what, talk to people who have actually done that stuff. Um, I think that one of the things we also see, that I see anyway, is siloing. And so, you know, look, I, I mentioned, you know, political scientists could learn from uh, clinical trialists. Clinical trialists could learn from political scientists. Like, you know, each of us has some sort of different varying level of experience in different things. And like someone else has tried to do this before and maybe failed, but figure out what that was. I guess I would say um, I don't think there's anything wrong with a parade for science. Uh, I think the, I called it a party for science. I was like, oh my god, we threw a party for science and a million people came. How cool is that? <laughs> I honestly thought no one would show up. Um, and so I think the point, as you said, it's like the point is not the march. The point is saying there are a lot of people who think that science is important, um, and this that was a really exciting opportunity to build a coalition of people who shared that value, um, including the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is how I know Michael Halpern. Um, and so figuring out um, these kinds of like larger events are a way to engage people, to bring them into the community, to expose them to activism, to have them start to ask this question of how can I use my voice? Um, and so the answer to that question for me is always a question in response, just kind of cheating, but it's, well, what are you good at? Right? So like, I can't say that you and all of your colleagues should do any one thing because what if someone's um, secretly a really good songwriter or animator or illustrator or poet or has some really famous friends they can get to tweet about it or like what are your assets? Um, and so I think, or are you a really good writer? Should you be blogging? Should you be writing op-eds? Um, I think that that is always the question. 
what are you good at? And then how can you use that in the service of the things that you care about? And that obviously is not just about science, but a much more general statement. I don't have advice for scientists, <laughs> but um, since this is the last question, I will say that for journalists also, it is really important to play the long game and to look beyond the current administration. Hopefully we're not all dead in a nuclear war soon, but if, <laughs> assuming that we are all still around, there will be another president, there will be another administration. Think long and hard before you cross that line from journalist to activist and make sure that that is really the best use of the path you've chosen. My activism for today is to say we all need to stop being addicted to single-use plastic because it's strangling the planet. <laughs> <laughs>